Once upon a time, there was a great wind, a mighty life-giving energy that breathed everything into existence, a power that moved along the waters of the deep, the Spirit of God. One day, a group who loved God was praying and meeting, celebrating a Jewish feast with friends and family, unaware of what was going to happen. Heaven was about to pay a visit. A violent wind filled the room where they prayed. Tongues of fire descended, separated, and rested on each of them. The Spirit of God didn't just come near them, the Spirit filled them. And each one began to speak in a foreign language, the many languages of all the people who lived in Jerusalem. All those who passed by marveled at what they saw. How could it be that each one could hear their own native language at the same time? Some claimed it was miraculous. Others scoffed and called them drunk. But Peter stepped forward and boldly proclaimed the truth. What the scripture described long ago had now come to pass right before their eyes. I will pour out my spirit, the Lord told his people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Here was the moment. The power of God filled the faithful. The body of Christ rose up, alive and active, equipped and empowered to love God, to love others. The good news continues to be proclaimed. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the best news is, for those who believe, the story never ends. Here in a few weeks, we have uh, Pentecost coming up, so we're doing a series leading up to that called Pentecostal Fire. And last week, we talked a little bit about revival and the need for revival in our nation right now and what we don't really want with revival and other topics to start us out. Today, I want to dive into what kind of things must happen before revival. There are things that have been shown to be true in all past revivals as far as what preceded them. These things are based in Scripture. We want revival, right? Amen. I told you last week there would be a cost to revival. Are you ready to count the cost? Today we're going to look at some of those costs because those precede revival. If we're going to look at... um, if we're really ready for revival, we have to decide if these costs are too much for us. And I know our series is Pentecostal Power, but you have to understand Pentecostal Power is rooted in revival. The very first revival was in Acts when Pentecost happened and the church was launched. So what precedes revival? First thing is, we must long for renewal in our lives. Have you ever longed for something? Maybe your spouse has been out of town and you've longed for them to return. Maybe your child lives over in St. Louis and you're away from her for a week and you long to spend time with her, even though she wants to go to Target and spend money. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you know what it's like to long for things. When we long for renewal in our lives, we understand it starts with us. We have to want revival so much that our lives literally change, and they change for the better. We want to renew what we are to be more and more and more like Christ. You see, revival will not come with an unholy lifestyle. Revival will not come when people are steeped in sin. Psalm 80, 18. Then we will never abandon you again. Revive us so we can call in your name once more. We must be to the point where we can earnestly say we will never abandon God again. 
How many of you have abandoned God at some point in your life? You don't have to raise your hand. I know I have. I've turned from God several points in my life. In every case, one thing was true. I wanted what I wanted instead of him. I wanted myself instead of him. I wanted nothing to do with holiness because holiness cramped my style. I would go to church and I would play church, but like standing in a garage won't make you a car. Sitting in a pew or a chair doesn't make you a Christian. Oh, I played the game. Millions of Christians are playing the game right now. They sit in comfortable chairs every Sunday, hear some good music, enjoy a short message, and then they check off the box for the week. They check out. They're not seeking God through the rest of the week. They... and. Being Christian is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, 365-day-a-year thing. You don't get one moment off. Psalm 85, 6. Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? When we get revived, we get to be joyful. We want to praise God. Worship isn't boring to us. We long to worship Jesus. Have you ever longed just to be in his presence and worship him? When we're revived, we come alive. We have to want that personally. It's not going to happen corporately until it happens personally in your life. It takes some personal time in worship. Come to church and worshiping is great, and we should do it. But we have to spend some time in personal worship or we're missing something big. We have to set aside time in our lives to worship God. The Bible says the way we live our life even is an act of worship. Does your life worship God? Romans 12.1, a very popular verse. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Wow. The way to worship him is our bodies becoming a sacrifice to him and we're living a holy lifestyle that he says as acceptable. And wow, all of a sudden we are worshiping him with our life, not with song, not with time in church, time out there in the highways and byways of life. We're doing worship every single moment of every single day because Romans 12, 1 is on our mind. body is a living sacrifice. There's things you won't do. You certainly won't be comfortable in sin. We'll do things like Christ. We'll love others like Christ. Man, whew, that's challenging sometimes. I have a shirt that says, Jesus loves you. I'm trying. It's hard sometimes. There's people out there It's like, oh, Lord, help me. I'm just being real with you. But we have to love like Christ loved. And, you know, I'm sure Christ thought, oh, man, Peter, why aren't you getting it? But he still loved him. He still had passion to see Peter become all he could be in Christ. And that's what we got to have for the people. Even if they are not potentially all they could be in Christ, we have to love them to the point where they can become that. Because they're not going to become that with having hateful judgment after them. This is how we seek renewal in our lives, to become more like Christ, become more like him every single day, to become indeed little Christ, to love him so much that we want what he wants, we hate what he hates. That sounds like a strong word, but there were things Jesus hated. There are things that God finds detestable. It's okay for us to find those things detestable and not in the name of tolerance say they're okay. God's people must repent before revival will come. Oh, repentance is not a fun thing to talk about. We don't like talking about repentance because repentance requires something of us. And it indeed is required before revival. Another popular verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If by people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. There are some conditions in there. Humbling yourself, praying and seeking God's face, turning from wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. You know, recently, Pastor Nicole and I started on this journey to lose weight. And I did that because I realized I was committing sin the way I was. And it wasn't that I'm a big guy. It was that when I would get a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups, I wouldn't eat one. I would eat the whole bag and be a glutton. You know, God doesn't like gluttony. I had to repent for that. And plus, I want to be healthy. I want to see my grandkids. I don't want to die at 50 and not see my grandkids because it's, I know my daughter, she's going to wait a while. Now, my son, he may have a ring by spring. I don't know. But I want to see my grandkids. And God gives us those guidelines to not be a glutton, for instance. It's a guardrail to protect us. But I had to repent for that. So in our Celebrate Recovery, that's what I'm working on. This Tuesday, I get 30 days of being good and not making food an idol for me. You see, the church in America has turned from God. A lot of it has. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the people in the building. We have Christians living lives that you really can't tell are different than the world. They're lukewarm at best. Damage the kingdom because... People don't want their Christianity. They see no difference. It's consumer-based. People come to church to consume, but don't ask them to serve. Please, if you're be a, a Christian, if you claim to be a Christ follower, if you claim to be Christ-like, have a servant's heart. I was asked this week, we were interviewing uh, a new guy for our Louisville location, and my boss had me and a few other people in the room, and he asked us, what do you like most about Veland? What gets you up in the morning to go to work? And when he got to me, I said, I like to serve. I get paid for it, but I like to serve. I have a servant's heart. That's, that's just who I am. Other people have other gifts. And he told me later, he's like, I recognize that in you. I'm like, wow, that's a good thing. Thank you for recognizing that in me. That tells me that something I'm doing, I'm doing right. We should serve. Jesus served. It should be natural to us. We should seek to serve others in any way, I can, any way you can. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. If someone puts out on social media, I need help with something, be the first one to jump in. If you know someone's struggling financially, if you can help them, jump in. If you know someone has something at their house that's broken and you have the tools to fix it, if you have the wherewithal to fix it, jump in. If something that the church needs done and you have the ability and you have the time to do it, jump in. Be a servant. So how do we fix this problem of consumerism in America and in the church. How do we fix it? One word, repent. The church as a whole needs to repent before God. That is, turn away from the sin and come back as a holy bride without spot or wrinkle. Do you know Jesus is coming back for a holy bride without spot or wrinkle? Church is kind of wrinkly right now. Want revival? Repent. We have all the things we need, and we act like it. We need to repent personally in our lives. Revelation 3, 14 through 16. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This message from the one who is, amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know the things you do that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, 
I will spit you out of my mouth. Does that familiar? We are in a Laodicean church age. If you go on to see the rest of how it describes the church at Laodicea of not wanting for anything, of having everything, you can see that it very much describes the church in America. And if you look at churches over the sea, seas, you know, you can see the other churches in Revelation describing them. Maybe we'll get to do a series on the churches. Are we more like the church in Lady O.C.? Do we fit that bill? Repentance is not a popular message. In fact, there are pastors that stay totally away from it. People get uncomfortable. We don't want people to get uncomfortable when they come to church, or do we? These are people's lives we're dealing with. It's heaven or hell for them. If we don't tell them the truth, do we really love them? It, we've taken love to mean tolerance of sin, and that's just not true. If you saw somebody running off a cliff, would you not try to yell at them and say, Stop! Don't go any further! People are running off the cliff, going to hell, and we're watching them in the name of tolerance. We cannot tolerate some of the things that are going on in the world today. You know, you say, well, they may not like me. Jesus wasn't liked. The Bible says we'll be hated. But you know, for those that will listen, those that will come to salvation, it's a priceless thing. We're going to love people right to hell. We can't do that. We have to teach repentance. We have to talk about it. We have to do it ourselves. If we want revival, repentance is a must. Acts 3.19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so your sins may be wiped away. This is probably the single largest hindrance to the power of God in people's lives and revival. People say nothing happens when they pray for someone. People get angry at God about it. Check this out, James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now, we went over that last week. If you want wonderful results, there's a choice you have to make. You have to be righteous. We don't have to be perfect, but we can't sit in sin either. God understands mistakes, but if your mistakes involve saying you're sorry of the same thing over and over and over again, are you really sorry about it? sermon might be making you uncomfortable. We pray for revival here. We pray for the power of God in our lives. This is how it happens. And next, we have to be humble. Pride is a killer. Proverbs 6, 18, 16, 18. This is a popular one too. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. God's Word says it. It isn't wrong for us to like to do a good job or be happy that we did, but to be prideful about stuff will trip us up. It will literally take us into destruction. You see, have you seen big-name pastors that have fallen here lately? We've seen them all over TV. It's sad. It really is. I saw one particular one that fell, and I don't know what's going on in this guy's life, and I'm not judging him one bit, but two weeks after he fell, all over Facebook is a documentary saying, documentary about XX Church, a mega church exposed. They're waiting out there for us to mess up. They're writing about it. They're showing movies about it. We cannot think so highly of ourselves that we can think we don't, aren't going to fall. You see, one thing that all these pastors had in common when, when they would give interviews or after some time would go by or they would talk is that they all had pride. Most of them would admit they did. They got to this place, they were selling books, they, the church had good music, and I'm not against big churches at all. Believe me, I'm not. I'm not saying that. 
But this is the leader of a church. He would get to a place where he would think, I'm doing this instead of God is doing this. I had a pastor before tell me, I may have told you this already, never let your charisma take you where your character cannot sustain you. Oh, you may have charisma and you may, may be able to, I like talking in front of people, but God help me if I ever get to the point where my character cannot sustain where I'm at. There's when you get into really bad territory. It's such an easy trap to fall into. It's something we won't get called out on maybe initially because that person's just proud of the good job they're doing. That person's proud of what they're doing. And it doesn't even sound like a bad thing. We're told it's okay to be proud. And then people turn on you. Jesus was our example. He was humble. He was the opposite of pride in every single way. And if we want to have revival, we have to have humility. If we want the power of God, we have to be humble. Isaiah 57, 15, the high and holy and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high place and holy place, and with those whose spirits are contrite and humble, I will restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. There's the promise. Revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. I will restore the crushed spirit of of the humble. There's a great promise there. If you're feeling down, if you're feeling crushed, pressed, depressed, solutions, humility. Best way to be humble? Serve. Serve somebody. Do something nice for somebody. And don't do it for yourself. Do it for them. Don't do it to get accolades for yourself. Do it for them. He will restore us. He will revive us. There's that word revive again. He will literally bring life into us by being humble. What a promise. If we walk in that way where we prefer others over ourselves instead of what we can get, we love even the unlovable. We serve others instead of take. Finally, God's people are revived through initiative. Isaiah 59, 16, he was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed, so he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm, and justice sustained him. God jumps in. This happens before revival. If we do all of the above, we will see God move before revival. What does that look like? It looks like signs and wonders. It looks like people being healed. It looks like people being delivered. It looks like situations changing. The world would not have changed on their own. It looks amazing because God is doing it. Titus 3.5, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Oh my gosh, our God is so merciful. We deserve death and hell, but he made a way for us to be saved. He sent his only son to die for our sins, and that's truly God moving in a huge way. He showed it then, and that preceded the blowout at the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Through that, he's giving us new life. He has indeed brought us to life. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you should be brought to life and doing nothing on our own to deserve it. Aren't you glad there's new life in Christ? Aren't you glad there's salvation? Aren't you glad that we don't have to worry about being good enough? It isn't about works, although works are going to come. If you're saved, you'll want to do good things. That just goes without saying. If we want a revival in this church, and I've, I've heard it pray for I heard Davey pray for it this morning. If we want to see the power of God in this church, we want to seek power of God move. I've heard that too. We want to see God move in our area and our nation. I have heard it. But are we ready to do what it takes? Are we ready to get on our knees? 
Are we ready to spend some time in prayer and travail over the sins of our nation? Tonight, here's my ad. Tonight, we're going to do that. We're going to have targeted prayer points, and we're going to have a time of worship in between each of those prayer points. It is going to be a powerful time. Come back. Make prayer a priority. This isn't our normal prayer night. We're going to have a time of worship and prayer. We're going to have a time of calling on God's name to do the supernatural in our area, in our country, in this church, for our families. Those are just some I'm thinking of. For revival, come back tonight. Come back tonight. We may sing some songs you don't know. In fact, my wife was like, what song is this? She goes, but there's some good songs. We're going to sing to God tonight. We're going to address prayer needs tonight. If you have prayer needs, if you need healing, whatever, if you need to stand in for someone else that may have a need, we're going to do that tonight too because God's our healer. It's vitally important that we do this. It's important that we do this often Revival is needed in America, and I believe revival is coming. If we play a part in it or sit at the sidelines, it's up to us. Jesus, we thank you for, for your spirit this morning, God, for your Holy Spirit, for your spirit that revives us. God, I thank you for each person in this room. God, I thank you for each prayer warrior in this room that longs to see revival in this area and nation. God, revive us again. God, bring life into us again. God, touch each person in this room again. As we now celebrate your death and resurrection, and remember, through communion, God, I ask, Lord, that your presence be here, that communion isn't just about eating a wafer and, and, and drinking some juice, God, that it becomes more than that, that it becomes alive to us, that we understand what's going on. In your name we pray. Amen. Davy, can you come up and play, play some music while we... That's fine, too. And while you want to come up and pass out the... Keep that music going, Robert. What makes a gift good or memorable? It definitely has to be thought through. It more than likely came at a high cost, either financially or time spent. It has to be a specific need or desire to have an intended impact. Every time we think about a gift, it brings back the joy we felt and reminds us of the sacrifice the giver made for us. No gift can outmeasure the weight and importance and sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross. When we celebrate communion, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember the gift of salvation that Jesus gave to each one of us. Jesus explained in this meal that it was about to mark the start of a new covenant between God and his people. Before Jesus' death, generations of Jews sacrificed animals at the temple to pray, pay for their sin. Jesus' sacrifice paid the penalty for sin once and for all. That's why we celebrate communion today. In Luke's version of the story, Jesus tells his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. When we take communion, it symbolizes the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. The wine 
or grape juice and the bread in communion represent the blood and body of Jesus that was poured out and broken as a sacrifice for our gift of salvation. Just like some gifts will always remind us of where we were when we received them, communion reminds us of where we were when we met Jesus. Communion is a time when we collectively reflect on the covenant that binds us together. It's also a time to individually reflect on the price Jesus paid for us to be in relationship with him. Think back to where you were when you asked Jesus into your life. Where were you and what happened? What are two ways that communion is a great reminder of the sacrifice Jesus made on your behalf? What's one way you can show the gratitude of salvation? We talked a lot about that today. I'm going to pause for a second, make sure everybody gets there. Are we good with everybody opening? Okay. Let's pause and ask Jesus to forgive any known or unknown sin in our lives and make us clean. Jesus, we thank you for being here with us. We thank you for the time to remember your gift of salvation. God, I ask right now for forgiveness of any known or unknown sin in our lives. God, make us clean before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He said, take this and share among yourselves, for I'll not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. Jesus, thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood that covers a multitude of sins. Thank you for your blood shed on the cross. May take the grape juice. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you for your body that was broken for us on the cross. Jesus, we love you. Take the bread. And after supper, he took another cup of wine, saying, This is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement that is confirmed with my blood, which is poured out to you as a sacrifice. It is a new covenant. You had the Mosaic Covenant. You had the Davidic Covenant. You have Christ's Covenant now. A covenant that won't go away until the end of the age. His covenant with us to be our salvation, to be our help, to be our comforter. As we remember with communion, don't forget those things. Don't forget of the new covenant he made with us that was paid for with his blood and with his body. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you today for every person in this room. God, I thank you that, God, we we desire revival. We desire this, and God, we pray for this. God, make our hearts hungry for this. God, let us turn to you in everything we do. As we go this week, God, protect us. Be with us. Bring us back together tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.